This is Thrivecasters. Thriving, not surviving. Tackling youth issues that matter to you. Welcome to Thrivecasters. I'm Hattie, my host here at Thrivecasters. And today we're, we're talking about domestic violence. I'm joined with Ashley, a co-host. And um, we've got three guests today. Do you want to introduce yourself, guys? Hi, um, I'll go first. Um, my name's Naomi Donald, and I am a pioneer for Safe Lives, a nationwide domestic abuse charity. And I'm also founder of PUDS, which stands for Protect Our Daughters and Sons. And we are on a mission to protect all children and young people from abuse, exploitation, and criminality through education, empowerment, and elevation. Um, and that's me in a nutshell. But I'm very passionate about um, young people and domestic abuse. That's my area of expertise. And I'll hand over to Sam. Hi, everyone. Great. I'm Sam Billingham. I'm a survivor of domestic abuse. And I'm the face and founder of SODA, which is Survivors of Domestic Abuse. And it's an online support group for those who have experienced domestic abuse to come together to a safe haven without judgment um, and just for support, really. Hi everyone, I'm Kyle. I'm a master's student at criminology, master's student in criminology at Birmingham City University. Uh, my area of research is domestic abuse within the South Asian community, and I really hope my Wi-Fi doesn't cut out here. So, really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. So we've got three experts with us, um, and so should we answer the first question? Um, what are the signs of an unhealthy relationship? It's quite a broad question. Uh, so um, I think there's a, it can be quite varied as in what we can consider as signs of an unhealthy relationship. I think um, in the past it has been uh, directly focused upon uh, physical abuse, uh, but times have changed and the conversation has moved forward in what we can perceive as signs of an unhealthy relationship. It can be um, as like the backbone of what's considered um, uh, domestic abuse now is based upon control as what many scholars have uh, perceived it to be that could be controlling what any, somebody is wearing and uh, controlling where somebody goes and constant checkup and it could be also signs of humiliation where an individual um, goes out of their way to embarrass their partner or someone in their uh, in their household or it could be um, general peer pressure to control someone's behavior yeah i've seen an interesting um post on Instagram um, just yesterday actually and it had a breakdown of like about seven categories it did kind of um, make it specific to men but I think it's a general thing so it says great men want a teammate so in a partner of course uh, number two career men want supporters number three broken men want fixes or replacement mothers number four lazy men want people pleasers and number five, insecure men want puppets. And number seven, narcissists want women with low self-worth. And um, obviously, like I said, it's not only specific to men, but um, the, um, the insecure men want puppets. That kind of links into what you were saying. That's a category, isn't it? Yeah, that, that kind of hit home with me, just the insecure men want puppets, because that's reminded me of myself when I was in abusive relationship. And the key thing for me was, as we've already said, it wasn't about the physical abuse, it was about the control. And it happened right at the honeymoon period, so when everything is so new and exciting. And he isolated me from my friends, from my family. So it started off subtly with, oh, don't go and see your mum tonight, stay in. And because you think you're all loved up and you think, yeah, I won't go tonight. And that one night turned into a week, two weeks, and then it was two months. And then when the physical abuse did come into the relationship, I'd got no one to speak out to, I've got no one to confide in. Um, so the insecure men wanting puppets, at that time I was his puppet, and whatever he said, I believed straight away. Um, so I think that's really important to kind of use the word isolation, as we've already said, you know, it's about power and control and not just physical abuse. 
Yeah, and um, I'd like to agree with that as well. Um, in terms of um, the signs of an unhealthy relationship, obviously the physical abuse is easy to see because it's physical. You can see the bruises, you can see a broken arm. But um, when it is your mind that is being abused, it's very, very difficult to see. So it's very difficult to spot the signs and even more difficult to spot the signs of an unhealthy relationship between young people because um, you know they're they're at a stage where they're exploring where their boundaries are and where the lines are within relationships. Um, so yeah, I think especially for people that may have had um, maybe difficult upbringings, they might have even more distorted um, uh, expectations and stuff, and be even more vulnerable to that um, kind of abuse. And I think the um, the the thing you said about isolating and um you know you isolation to then make their partner a puppet kind of is interesting in the time that we're in now because one of the questions is about how isolation affects people in um sorry uh, isolation affects um domestic abuse and um there's like a, there's a lot of studies into how isolation is actually very unhealthy and it's very dangerous to the mind yeah and, uh, Sorry, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Through, through the isolation, I lost my job. So when I met this guy, I was a legal secretary. I got a great job, a great life. And he accused me of having an affair with my boss because at the time my boss was male. So he locked me in the flat that we shared together, uh, wouldn't let me out. And he threw my mobile phone out of the seventh floor window. So I had no way of even phoning in sick or anything. So for me, that isolation, it kind of, took me away from who I was. Once I lost my job, I lost my self-identity. I couldn't do anything for myself. And also being isolated, they can control you 24 seven. They can see everything that you do. So obviously with the situation we're in now with the COVID-19 and we've, we've seen a spike in domestic abuse, not just the incidents, but domestic abuse deaths, it's because of that isolation, because it's harder for people to speak out, to make that phone call without being constantly watched what you're doing. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, do we have? Do, does anyone have anything? Um, any experience or information on the um, the replacement mothers um, kind of aspect that I mentioned about broken men wanting replacement mothers? Um, I yeah, I can relate to that. Um, I went through my experience of domestic abuse from the age of thirteen to twenty three. Um, and my perpetrator was actually one of my peers, so he was the same age, age as me. And um, obviously, like, now that I've got a lot older and um, I've studied and, you know, got the education, I'm understanding that um, my perpetrator having a broken relationship with his own mother and having um, a um, broken upbringing meant that he then... Um, went out to search for women, females that would look after look after him and become that mother figure for him. So all the things that his mom um, was unable to do or couldn't do, such as um, you know cook food and provide that love and that nurturing, they will then go for that in in um, from a partner. But at the same time, they 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 you know. They're, they're coming to you for this love and affection. However, they're not treating you very nicely. So it's it's very warped. It's a very, very warped situation to be in. That's really interesting. Yeah. My um, ex-partner loved his mom, respected his mom, would do anything for his mom. She was the only woman he would treat with respect. And he always used to say, if I was, if I was a woman like his mom, then he would marry me. So that was kind of a little bit weird that he obviously respected his mom but every other woman who was in his life he just controlled and treated you know awfully but he would always say if you became a woman like my mom I would marry you so that was kind of a little bit I don't suppose I took too much notice at the time because you don't when you're in that situation but now I'm out of it looking in that's kind of a, a strange comment to make I would think maybe he was a broken man too um, I think it's quite interesting how, especially like Naomi and Sam, you've been in similar situations where you felt like you were kind of, yeah, secluded into a space where you're, you know, this this 
horrible figure is basically lording over you and you can't really escape. And I was just wondering, at that point, did you know your rights as like, n- no, okay, <laughs> judging my son's response, no. Um, oh, and, nice. <laughs> and what rights do women have, and not just women, but men in that space have to actually get out, escape and actually head to safety? You want to go first, Naomi? Um, yeah, well, in terms of um, rights, we know that laws are put into place um, to basically help us. However, at the moment, um, you know, we've got a lot of amazing and fantastic services that are providing um, the right support and encouraging people to understand their rights. But as young people, we, we probably don't even know what day of the week it is, never mind our rights, you know what I mean? So when certain things were happening, um, i.e. Um, sexual assaults, um, you know, we, we didn't know that there was a name for it. We didn't know that it was a crime, you know what I mean? So I think um, it is about like really just informing people of what their rights are and holding the government accountable to make sure that, um, you know, people are, people are actually being able to exercise these rights. For example, I'm working with a woman at the moment who has been trying um, to get out of a property since January, and it is now June, in relation to domestic abuse, um, but she's getting loads of pushback from different local authorities saying, no, we can't have you because you don't live in this local authority. However, the government have now got a campaign saying, you know, um, well, they've been running it the whole way through lockdown, saying, if you need to leave home, you can. There's no refuge spaces available. There's no temporary accommodation available and no local authority um, wants to take somebody from outside of their local authority. So I think, um, yeah, we need to know our rights, but we also need to hold the government accountable to make sure that these rights can be exercised. Yeah, it was the same for me. Uh, I was in my early 20s and it was my first proper relationship and I just accepted everything as normal behaviour because I didn't know any different. I hadn't even heard of the word domestic abuse, didn't know what it was. And it was only when I left the relationship that I was handed, which I now know to be a women's aid questionnaire, and you answer these questions. And it was all to do with control. It was nothing to do with physical. And once I'd answered all those questions, it was only at that moment that I knew I'd been a victim. Um, after that, I was given an eight-week awareness course of everything I'd been through. Um, and the only reason I went on that course was because it was suggested by social services. So I just assumed I had to do it because if I didn't, I'd have my daughter taken away from me, which is something he had always told me that he'd get her taken away from me anyway. So like you say, you don't even know what day of week it is. You don't know anything, let alone your rights. And also with the work we do now, this is why I raise lots of awareness because people don't know they're being abused because it's not always physical. And if we do know our rights, we've been manipulated and controlled so much that we're told no one's going to believe us. So we don't. We don't make that phone call. We don't phone that number because we've been brainwashed. We've been manipulated for so long and programmed that we've now got to be unprogrammed. And then when we do make those calls, we're on waiting lists or it's a postcode lottery or we don't fit a criteria. So then we kind of feel, one, that our perpetrator was always right. And two, no one believes us. No one's going to listen to us. So what's the point? And again, I agree with what Naomi said about the government. It's great having these things in place, but they've got to work. If, if the government is saying you can leave now, then there's got to be a safe house or support as soon as that person asks for that help. Does stepping in make things worse? That is a big question. And like, how can we help out responsibly? I thought this was a really interesting question because going again on my personal experience, there were so many times I prayed that people would step in, but then I was always scared if somebody did step in because if they did, I would get it tenfold again. And then I always worried about their safety as well. There were many, many people who heard my screams, my cries, um, never phoned the police, never did anything, which I kind of find really sad. So I try and encourage people to, if they hear something or think somebody they know is being abused, just phone the police anonymously, tell them your concerns, and they might just go out there and sort of just make sure everything's okay. Someone in an abusive relationship hasn't got the the courage to make that call themselves. So it does need the community to kind of do that for them. Um, 
you know so that was a really really interesting question and just on the um, responsibility of others helping again it's just simply making that 999 call anonymously so you're not getting involved you're not giving your personal details but you just could be saving a life Um, I think for me, um, to add on to that, in terms of stepping and making things worse, I'm actually um, doing some research, a project with Safe Lives at the moment, and young people in terms of how can you help your best friend. So um, it's about like encouraging, um, like Sam just said, um, community and other people to get involved, but get involved safely as well. Like, you know, how do you help your friend that is in that situation? Um, like Sam just mentioned, like, you know, there's been, um, there's loads of cases and loads of memories and personal experience that I can remember where police could have been called by the neighbours or by bystanders and people choose not to get involved for probably a number of reasons. Um, but I do think um, there's lots of research now coming out about bystander interventions and how important they are and how they can work um, to actually stop this issue of domestic abuse because I mean when we look at the culture um just the, the whole youth culture in general at the moment and not even just at the moment throughout history women have always been seen as objects and um, and it's like we need to change that whole culture so we need to encourage more people to actually st st stand up to their friend and say um that, that was wrong, like, you know, or you shouldn't talk to your partner like that, whether it's a female or a male, like, do you know what I mean? You shouldn't talk to people like that, or I don't agree with that. And everyone's kind of got a band together to make that individual know that that is wrong. And that I completely agree with uh, Saba and Naomi there, um, saying we need to change this culture, we need to take away this barrier between peers and between your um, friends and your family. When you see... Uh, um, potentially domestic abuse between two people. We have to, it's our responsibility to create a safe space for our loved one there uh, and just simply say to them, I'm worried, this is what I'm seeing. Are you seeing this as well? And create an environment where you're telling this individual, it's not your fault and there's no judgment here. Speak freely and then you can take it on from there. It's like if you stand by and do nothing because that's, it's only gonna escalate the situation. You may not be able to see it until it's too late. So like uh, Naomi was saying, we need to change this culture. We need to take away this barrier. So there is things that we can be done. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the word culture because I was going to ask you a bit more about potentially looking into certain cultures where potentially it's not necessarily seen as acceptable to speak out about these certain issues. Like how would you encourage certain cultures to talk up about it, even though it may kind of in court, some sort of like stigma attached to it as well. So with different communities, so, so specifically the South Asian community, there is a, a concept known as honour in which um, individuals are expected to uphold their um, their responsibilities depending on their um, on their gender. Uh, honour is he uh, heavily dependent upon um, the roles and actions of the women in the family, and often in the South Asian community. Um, Individuals don't know what they're experiencing is um, domestic abuse, often uh, drawing upon language barrier, because when somebody in the South Asian community are, is facing domestic abuse, they are often confided, what, 23 hours a day in the home, as so they don't have access to um, support, and often due to the language barrier, when they have, um, if there's like pamphlets or um, even TV adverts saying, call this number, it can't reach out to them because of that barrier. So that is something that needs to be tailored there. I think domestic abuse is a crime that, unless you've been through it, it's really, really difficult to understand. It's not, as, and obviously I'm not minimising this, but it's not as simple as a black eye or a slap. It doesn't even start that way. It starts with the power and control. And I think that's the important message that we've got to get across is 
how it starts and what it's actually like we've got to get rid of the stigma that's attached to it the stigma that it's just a domestic or that it's just between married couples we've got to break those kind of barriers down as well so people can get a proper understanding of what domestic abuse is and it is a crime it's not about love it's not about an argument or losing your temper my ex-partner never shouted my ex-partner never got angry he was always in control and that that was the thing he was always in control of absolutely everything and that is terrifying when somebody bombards you with phone calls or text messages when you've just popped to the shop that's two minutes away or you've been out somewhere shopping and they've seen you and they've described what you're wearing and where you're standing it's those things that really put the fear of god into you it's not necessarily the physical abuse some people aren't even physically abused either and again we've got to kind of get that message across there that it's about power and control hmm. and can i just add um as well in terms of culture of um, like you know within um, my culture the black um caribbean culture um a lot like the south asian culture um a lot of things are based on that um, honour and not bringing shame to the family. So you have to keep things to yourself. And the other barrier um, that we will have, um, like the community that I grew up in, was a very inner city community um, dominated by youth violence. So my ex-perpetrator was also part of a well-known gang. So who's phoning the police? Because if I phone the police, then I'm going to be victimised by the rest of the community and the wider family. Do you know what I mean? And even though I was pushed to phone the police in the end, that's the only way I got out of the relationship, it was because I was pushed to um, between life and death. So it got to the point where I knew that either me or my daughter would be murdered within that home. And so I had no choice. But then I've had to live with the consequence of that after. Because then like what Sam said, in terms of the support that you get after, once you have spoken up and gone for help, there is no support, literally no support. So, you know, your your mental health is going to be affected. Like, you know, once you've gone through a relationship like this, I came out with severe, um, severe anxiety um, and depression. I was self-medicating through alcohol and um, drugs because I, I just didn't know how to get myself back on track. And it was just one day when I went and spoke to my doctor and um, revealed everything that was going on. It was a doctor that then actually um, put me forward for counselling. Do you know what I mean? And then I still had to leave my community and um, go away and heal myself for 10 years because the community still didn't understand why I have sent one of our community to prison. And I don't think they get it now. He's been in jail 18 years and I still get told, um, I still get called a liar because, because I've sent somebody to prison, no matter what the crimes are. So it's a very, very good point that you brought up there, Ashley, in terms of um, community, because, it, it, I mean, in terms of culture, because it does actually inform a lot of responses, the way that we respond to domestic abuse. Absolutely. And I think there's, there's just so much onus on the victim. You're being blamed for phoning the police. No one's mentioned his behaviour or what did he do to exactly. you to phone the police. It's kind of why, why did you do that? There's just, I think a lot of people are so scared about this subject for some reason that they don't want to ask those questions for whatever reason. But they must ask those questions in order to understand why victims do things. Another thing is, we leave and go back so many times. I did. I left loads of times, but I still went back because he promised that he'd change. He promised that he loved me. He said it would never happen again. And I wanted all those things. So I went, went back. It was only when he slapped my, uh, split my lip open whilst I was old and had 10 month old daughter that I actually left for good. But nobody said, oh, why, what did he do for you to leave? It's, but why didn't you leave sooner? And then when you do try and leave sooner, there's no support there to help you stay and not to go back. Um, what, what do you think about going to family members? Because a lot of people are sceptical um, about going to the police uh, for some of the reasons that have been mentioned about um, a lack of support afterwards and the way the police are going to um, address it head on. And there's a level of um, a lack of uh, security, you know, when, you know, information is coming out and the partner might be like, OK, so my partner is going against me do you know what i'm saying and they may be left with them so 
often it might be, um, you know, a good thing to go to the parents, you know, maybe the parents that could um, take them in. Well, um, I, I can answer that because um, my ex-partner's family had a lot of involvement in our relationship. Um, everybody knew what was going on, but I think it's very dangerous to rely on your family to sort it out because what the family then do is say, we're sorted out. So there would have been times where they would have come to my house and removed him from my house because they'd known that he just beat me up. Yeah, but once he's removed from my house, he's going to come back. He'll only stay away for a few days or a week tops. Um, there were instances where um, I was removed from the house. Um, you know, his, his uncle came and picked me up and said, I'm going to bring you to your mum's and I'm going to tell him that you've left the city so he can never um, he can never come back to you again. That lasted 24 hours because by the following day, he was on the phone to my mum um, crying um, saying that he was um he, he had taken some tablets he was going to commit suicide because i had left him and um you know because my mom not my mom's fault but because my mom didn't understand um, the relationship she just believed it would be best for me then to go back to him because you don't want to have that guilt of somebody's commit suicide because of you do you know what i mean and it's so i think um it's good if the family are if the family can stand up and really like help you through the process and take you out of that process and make sure that it doesn't happen again but really and truly many families are not going to do that yeah i agree with with naomi and also for me i was embarrassed i didn't want to tell my mom and dad what was happening and also there were some things that happened that i didn't want to tell my mom and dad or my family so it can be good but also it, it can be bad as well as you say it depends on the actual family i guess but for me I, I just couldn't tell my parents some some things so i just stayed yeah i was thinking more of an as an outsider looking in if you could intervene and the person who's being abused if you could um tell their family but i definitely oh, right. uh, i definitely um see where you're coming from about um the the abuser often plays the victim and then you know, because of the connections and you, um, because people know them, they're going to sympathise with them and you might give them another chance and then it's another chance. I definitely understand, yeah. So the police mm. is, you know, the safer option a lot of the time, yeah. Mm. But I agree with what you're saying, Hatton, because what you're saying is if you know that somebody is a victim of a, abuse, um, then <laughs> could you go and talk to somebody from their family and let them know what's happening yeah. so that they can help them if need be? Yeah, so, yeah, I agree with that as well. Rasila, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, just sort of briefly, I think everybody's kind of touched on it. Um, to do with the culture and to do with parents and even asking for help, from my experience just looking around universities and things, a lot of the time people get into relationships that might be abusive in one way or another, but it's also idealised. And like this is something that this is something people want. You want to be with a strong man or a, a powerful, independent woman, and all these types of things. How do you guys reckon? You know, what, what's the way that we can educate each other to say that these standards are not actually appropriate? That there is, you know, even though they might look really, really happy on the outside, that actually there's so much more going on, and this isn't what a healthy relationship looks like. Um, I think when I talk about it um, in, in that context, talk about domestic abuse in that context, I always think of fairy tales because I think most yeah. people can relate to growing up um, either reading fairy tales or watching Disney movies where you had like, um, you know, a princess who was going to be saved by Prince Charming and they live happily ever after. And the bad people in the story were usually um, the evil stepmother who would look like a witch or the troll under the bridge that looks like an ugly monster. So when I talk to young people, I make it very clear that Prince Charming can be a perpetrator. They're not necessarily going to look like a monster or look like a bad person. They um, can be very popular. They can be very loved by everybody. And, you know, so I think... Um, if that answers the question, I think, um, yeah, it is about like just being real about the fact that abuse can come from anybody. Anybody can be a perpetrator and anybody can be a victim. I think it's quite interesting as well that um, you've both mentioned that you've got children. And I suppose, um, Mikhail, you can also um, chime in on this, but 
how do you help those who have been indirectly affected by domestic abuse? Because I suppose if you're in that space and you're growing up with it, and especially like, I'm, cause I, when I um, first agreed to do this, I didn't actually think I had anyone that had been affected by domestic, abu- um, domestic violence. And then I realized actually, yes, one of my good friends was, and I'm just thinking about how like that affected her children and how it's affected your children. And also, yeah, if they're not necessarily speaking about it, how can you encourage them to talk and, heal before it becomes trauma in a sense but um that's a question to everybody in the chat really oh do you want to oh all right oh, go you go first. <laughs> yeah um so my daughter is now 20 um she was four years old when her father went to prison um she's not seen him in all of these years however um you know because she witnessed so much at a young age i didn't really think that she would have been affected because she was only four But um, as she was in reception at school, she um, had disclosed at school that her father was in prison for trying to kill her mum. And then the school had a conversation with me and they were really, really good. I have to praise that primary school because um, they had that conversation with me and I told them that, yes, this has happened. And then um, she was actually allocated like a school counsellor. So... The whole way through primary school, like um, every Friday or something, she would go and sit with this counsellor and get to talk about her feelings or express it through pictures and stuff. And um, she she had access to that through the whole the whole way through primary school. So she had a lot of um, behaviour issues and anger issues as a result of what she had witnessed. And um, so she was able to leave the classroom and go and have that safe space and time to talk. And I think that really helped her then um, remain settled while she was at secondary school because obviously then as she got older um, you know her dad was still trying to contact her and as she got older she became more conscious of um, what he was in prison for and you know what I mean but then um, there's lots of research that will talk about um, children and father absence and um, it would actually suggest that young girls over the age of like 19 will start to show the effects of father absence um, in terms of mental health, in terms of um, the relationships that they then go on to choose. And so now that she's 20, I'm starting to see certain things play out just as the research has suggested. So now it's about, um, because I'm aware of this, just about being um, proactive in terms of constantly talking to her to make sure that um you know if she wants to get extra help and therapy around this time in her life then she can get it so for me my daughter was 10 months old that's when he slapped me and that's when i left and at that point he a few months later he wanted to take me to a court family court for contact and parental responsibility but at that time she was 10 months old and i was adamant because he was a violent alcoholic that I didn't want contact to take place. So I wanted to protect her from everything that I'd been through. I didn't want her to be affected that way. She's now 14. So even though I left a long time ago, this is a new journey now. This is her journey. So her father is deceased now, sadly. So she, she's at the stage where she's asking inquisitive questions about her father. So I'm kind of torn because when she was 10 months old, she didn't have a voice. She she didn't know what was going on. So it was my duty to protect her. But now she's growing up and she's 14. She has every right to ask those questions and she has every right to know about, about him as a father. So I've kind of got to forget the fact that he was my perpetrator. He's now her father, if that makes sense. So all those questions that she asks, I'm the only one who can answer them. So, and I have answered everything to the best of my ability, truthfully, but it's really hard because now I'm mom as well. So I'm not a victim anymore, but I'm mom and I'm still trying to protect her as, as a mom would. She's got um, the half brothers. She's got another family out there who I've tried to encourage for her to make contact with, to speak to. She has met some of them, but it's not a strong enough contact as if he was still alive. So it's really, it's quite sad because as I say, it's her journey now. She she wants to know where she comes from. She wants to know what her dad was like. I can't give her the answers that she really, really wants. I can't tell her what she really, really wants to hear. I can only go on what I went through. And 
she still has those questions but at 14 she's learning about herself as well so I think it's a little bit difficult for her to ask those questions from her from her family as well so it's really difficult to try and find that balance as well and for her to kind of accept where she's from and and, and accept what's happened so I think it, it's really difficult because you want to do right by mom being mom you've got to sort of not forget what he did but explain to her in a way that she'd understand as well. So it's really, really difficult when your children are involved because at the beginning I did the right thing because I protected her. But now it's like sometimes you do question yourself, did I do the right thing? Because unfortunately he passed away before she could meet him. So it's kind of got a little bit of guilt there thinking, did I, didn't I? And I suppose that'll always be there forever, but it's one of those but she's happy. She's, she's really happy. She's kind of outgoing. Um, but you always do wonder if those little things that crop up, was it because of what I went through? Was it something that she, 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 she was too young to remember what happened, but I, through again, research, you can, um, children can feel things when they're in the womb, can't they? They can sense things. So it's kind of mom guilt now more than anything. Um, but hopefully, she'll go on to meet someone who won't abuse her. However, saying that she has had a boyfriend and he has displayed so many red flags. He has displayed controlling behavior. So I've had to explain, you know, this isn't right. He shouldn't speak to you that way. He shouldn't treat you that way. So it, it's just finding that balance, I think. Yeah, it's all about damage limitation, isn't it? When it comes to people who are indirectly affected and stuff. And sometimes you might have to pick between um, two evils. Mikhail Hill, do you have any... Sorry, I'm up and up to your name. Hi, uh, uh, Mikhail, thank you. Yeah, do, do you have any um, anything to add on to um, who is actually indirectly affected? Uh, so I just want to say, first of all, thank you for um, sharing your experiences, Naomi and Sam. It's very amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so in regards to um, people who are indirectly involved, uh, it could also be um, the local community, as it was uh, previously alluded to, so that when hearing about someone who you're close to or formerly close to about um, uh, who has gone through domestic abuse, um, it, can, it can affect them indirectly as well when learning about such experiences. So. Mm -hmm. And can I just add, um, as of uh, Monday, I've just got it up on my phone now, the domestic abuse bill has now been amended to include children as direct victims of domestic abuse when they are living in homes where domestic abuse is taking place. Um, because um, like you just mentioned, make it, make, Mikhail, sorry. Um, like, you know, um, we often look at uh, the children that live within these homes as indirect like victims when actually um, they are directly affected. Um, however, like, you know, like the wider community, yes, they are indirectly affected. Like, you know what I mean? They're like secondary um, victims of the abuse, mm, if you completely like. Completely agree. Um, but I think, um, I think it's a big step forward to, to have that recognised in the domestic abuse bill because um, it was only 2016 when they updated the cross-government definition to um, include 16-year-olds as um, victims of domestic abuse. Do you know what I mean? Because prior to that, it was like from 18 and up. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, um, being a young person experiencing it, you're thinking, well, this only affects adults. And because the word domestic means at home, you're also thinking, well, I need to be living with this person for abuse to be taking place when actually, like, um, yeah, it can take place anywhere, can't it? So, yeah, I just wanted to add in that. I completely agree. And this is, to be fair, it's one of the things I've always wanted to ask. And it's like how, because I, I do think domestic violence, when, um, when you initially think about it, you think about women who are, you know, being abused in a household. But I have heard experiences of men also being abused in the household as well. And it's like, how, how would you help someone who is in that predicament? Because I know you've also got this like toxic masculinity of a man should be strong, a man should be like the leader of the household. So then for them to flip that binary and say, actually, I've just been hit. Actually, I, I don't know how to get out of this. How would you help them without also like bruising the ego and all that sort of complexity that's around that? I think it's not, 
sorry oh go carry on something sorry i think it's a lot to do with just raising awareness which is really really important because it's kind of indirect for a start but it's also again it's a stigma attached it's it's the embarrassment for them that they feel that they can't speak out i always see it as a perpetrator perpetrator and a victim i don't see a male or a female it's, it's a perpetrator or a victim and it's about encouraging any victim to come forward any victim that it's not right to be treated that way whoever you are whatever your religion whatever culture and i think that's a strong message that everyone as a society should should be doing um I do a lot of retweeting and stuff for mankind on Twitter and they are on the Undiscussable podcast as well. And I know broadcaster Charlie Webster, she does a lot um, of support around male victims as well. So it's kind of lots of people doing little bits to try and encourage male survivors to come forward. So I completely agree with uh, what Sam was saying. Um, I think with there's a big barrier involved with uh, men acknowledging that in fact they are what they're experiencing is domestic abuse sometimes it's often brushed over say oh it's just one of these things sometimes these things happen but it's when the penny drops and somebody has to say to them no what you're going through isn't right this is this is abuse there in you got the next step, step is saying there's no judgment here take away that toxic masculinity understanding and get support or talk to somebody because once you go through that stage and when somebody acknowledges that that's when progress can really be made yeah and i i agree and i think the common de denominator in all of this is that uh, many victims don't actually recognize that they're victims and so i think that um comes as an um, additional barrier for men in terms of um like you know um feeling like they can't speak to anybody about what they're going through. So I really think it is about, um, um, like Sam said, raising awareness um, and creating more safe spaces just so that they can have conversations um, in regards to like, you know, their mental health and well-being, where then they might feel comfortable enough to um, talk about further things. So yeah, maybe more safe spaces for men. Okay, we've kind of um, got to get through a few of these questions because we've only got 15 minutes left. Um, so how do people get neglected by services meant to support them? Um, I think we've already touched on that um, with, the, um, with the police sometimes. But um, what about the, um, the counselling and the um, accommodation, etc.? Well, a lot of the work I do um, is in relation to the invisibility of black girls um, within domestic abuse services um, because um, there's lots of research um, to show um, that talks about the ad adultification of young black girls, meaning they are seen as um, more adult-like than their um, white counterparts. Um, I've also done lots of reading around um, white girls' tears being more valued than black girls' tears um, and there's also loads of research around um, um, victims um, of abuse or exploitation reaching out for help and then being penalized so they then are looked at as um, the criminal so I think that's a massive a massive um, barrier. I was going to ask are you speaking about being penalized by the authorities or by the community? Both, both, because you get penalised by the you get penalised by the community for speaking out about something that the community um, might turn a blind eye to, such as youth violence or domestic abuse, and then um, you're penalised. Imagine you've gone to a police station to report um, that you've been raped. Yeah, and the police are asking you why you were at that party or you know haven't got like empathy skills to be able to deal with you sensitively so the girls that i work with are girls that have gone to the police or gone to their children's home manager or something to talk about an experience that they've gone through and they've been either victim blamed to make it seem as if it's their fault or penalized because it's like well why were you drinking alcohol you're only 15 when you know that's not important this is a young person that is telling you that she ended up in a situation at a party yes alcohol was involved but um she she was raped and sexually assaulted so um 
yeah we've got we've got to, we've got to do better we've got to do better in really hearing the experiences of these girls and stop looking at them as if because they wear makeup and eyelashes and got big hair and and stuff looking at them as if they can manage everything that they are going through and what we have to understand is when somebody does ask for help it takes a lot of courage because yeah. they've been manipulated as i said earlier that no one's going to believe them so when they do finally take that leap and ask for help it's because they really can't take anymore that they can't put up with what they put up with for so long and they are penalized and sometimes it can be by being put on a waiting list as well so that person who might be speaking out today for all we know they could be suicidal and if they're put on a waiting list who knows what could happen they could either commit suicide or go back to the perpetrator so that's why it's so important that like Naomi said we've got to do better where as soon as people ask for support, they must get that support because otherwise people are going to, people are going to die. Basically. I don't know what else we can say to kind of get the message out there, but it's so important that support is out there for male and female victims, for any victim, as soon as they ask for help, they, they should get it. They've been through so much. They've been victim blamed, depending on what sort of relationship they're in, whether it's physical or coercive. They've been through so much and they're at rock bottom and they ask for help. I completely agree with what's being said. Um, in terms of being of, neg of neglect, I believe that it's coming from a structural level in which the government in which they are responsible for providing support and funds to um, services like women's aid and men, uh, men's mankind men say sorry it's it's not it's it's a fault of a structural level in which funding is supposed to be um given but it's often neglected as is not considered a priority at a government level i've been talking to um somebody who worked at, works at um a women's aid and she told me that often funding is given promised but then it's often drawn back because of um, current circumstances whether that's Brexit or that's to do with COVID or so, something like that. So I think it's a lot of the fault is from structure level and we need to hold the government into account there in which they are not uh, providing adequate services. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Because unfortunately, domestic abuse isn't seen as a priority. I think mm. it's taken about two or three years for the domestic abuse bill to go to be passed through Parliament. I did an interview about that uh, in 2018 when it was first talked about and when it was first in Parliament. And here we are in 2020 and it's still going through. For some reason, the government and the people who can make real change just don't understand how dangerous domestic abuse really is. And, that, and you're absolutely right, they should be held accountable, they can do so much more and they should do so much more. I remember the, the campaign during the, the COVID lockdown with the heart on the hand, you're not alone, but they are, even when people are leaving and when they're asking for help, they are alone because the money isn't there, the support isn't there. So they have got so much work to do and that they should be doing and domestic abuse has got to be a priority for our government. I think this time this ties into the last point um, about you know why is support not making a drastic impact on why are things not changing? Um, tying onto what Naomi said, um, do uh, it's, it kind of sounds like um, it, the police force could do with having more um, more specialized officers that can deal with these things and they've got the um, the know how and also an extra extra level of training given to all officers you know yeah i completely agree i think all specialist services should have regular updated training where domestic abuse is concerned because if they haven't got the knowledge or the empathy then there's no way they can support victims who need that help exactly and i'll tell you a quick example um when i um did eventually call the police um being in the community where i came from when the police first came to my house, two police officers, and they looked around the front room, and I, I, I was literally saying to them, I have been beaten, I have been raped, I have been sexually assaulted this morning. The policeman looked at a picture on my, um, on my um, fireplace and says, oh, well, you look very happy in this picture with me and my perpetrator. 
And I literally had to go mad and tell the officer the story behind that picture because that picture was actually taken at a service station um, up north when I'd been kidnapped from Birmingham and I was being driven to Preston. Yeah, and so it's kind of like those little those little comments they need to learn to keep to themselves. Like you know, just come here with um, empathy, compassion, and support, and make that victim feel like um, they can speak about what has happened to them, because they just make it more difficult. So um, I know Safe Lives do um, some really really good police training um, in terms of um, what's it called DA matters, domestic abuse matters. Um, I'd like to really find out, um, I suppose, from police forces, how they put that training into practice or what changes have come from that training. Um, so I think, yeah, they need more training. In, they need training in a lot of things, domestic abuse being one of them, but they need, um, they need to understand the different, um, the different cultures and the different barriers that are presented with each different, each different group. No, um, thank you guys for coming on Divecasters. I think it's been a really powerful episode and I think there's a lot of knowledge that a lot of our young listeners are going to be able to kind of take away and, and use in the future and actually maybe it might influence their, their career paths as well and actually putting that, that passion into some positive change. Um, so before we wrap up, I just need one point from each of you about, well, I'm going to say one piece of advice that you'd give someone who is in a predicament where they know someone is being domestically abused and they want to help. One piece of advice from each of you, what would you tell them? Um, I personally, um, I'm going to direct it to young people because that's who I work with. And I would say, um, you know, if you have a friend that you are worried about, yeah, talk to your friends, support your friend and make sure you talk to somebody else. I know everybody doesn't like to use um, Childline, but Childline is open 24 seven and they have professional counsellors online who can actually give you further help and advice. So I would just advise um, anyone, and if you're going through it yourself, um, speak to somebody, speak to somebody and seek help. I would say to someone who is experiencing domestic abuse, always go with your gut instinct. And don't believe your perpetrator when they say they'll change because they won't. And for anyone who's standing by watching someone experience domestic, excuse me, <clears throat> for someone standing by watching someone experience domestic abuse, just be there for them when they're ready to ask for your help. It's something as simple as going to the police station with them. Just be there when they're ready. Uh, so one thing I I, um, I think I can say in. Uh, specific focus to the South Asian community is that if if you see somebody who is going through uh, domestic abuse in this community, it is uh, vital that you approach them, talk to them about them, because there is a l lack of um, narratives and being vocal within this community. So be that support. Go to them. Say this is what I believe you're going through. I'm worried, and support them in any way that you can. So you go, like um, Sam said, go to the police station with them, go through the whole process with them. Don't leave them in the middle, just go through the whole journey with them. So if there's any advice I can say, it'll, it'll be that. My, my advice would be um, for someone who um, may not even think they're in an in a abusive relationship, but everyone who's in a relationship, question those norms, especially if you're, um, if you're new to relationships. Um, yeah, question those norms and don't be afraid to you know speak to other people to find out you know how normal they are thank you for listening in to thrivecasters today if you are on instagram please follow us on on point wm also follow the hashtag thrivecasters and we'll be back soon with some more topics that mean yeah positive things to young people who are listening in as well don't forget to follow us on social media at on point wm and hashtag thrivecasters Join us next time for more conversations that matter to you.